I'm one of the co-authors. My name is Tiffany and I'm one of the co-authors of a new report by the Framework for an Equitable COVID-19 Homelessness Response. Sharon McDonald and Alexis Kramer, as well as Barbara Pop, are also co-authors to this report. Um, my full-time professional job is based in Virginia where I do work around affordable and equitable homeownership. I have lived in professional expertise in topics as it relates to youth homelessness, child welfare, immigrant and parenting youth um, with system involvement, LGBTQIA plus youth homelessness, um, as well as serving as the executive serving on the executive committee of the National Youth Forum on Homelessness. Um, so um, I bring both uh, professional and lived expertise to the space and to the report. Um, I participated in this project because of my experience of housing instability um, with my son once transitioning out of the foster care system and my understanding of the barriers um, navigating um, my housing instability as an immigrant young person um, who had not had their um, citizen, while well, their permanent residency for a long period of time, and what um, what some of the challenges were due to um, some of the systemic issues um, uh, with finding housing for myself and my child, um, and some of the um, fears in doing that as well. Next slide, please. So um, the organizations behind the framework for an equitable COVID-19 homelessness response are noted on the slide. Um, it's an amazing group of experts which um, with deep passion for our shared work. So some of them, the National Innovation Services Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Barbara Pop and Associates, and you see the rest on the screen. Next slide, please. The framework itself was developed in early in the early stages of the pandemic and has provided the foundation for the work we have done together over the past 21 months. It is built on the following strategies. One, advance racial justice and equity. Two, address the highest needs first. Three, grow partnerships. Four, get people into housing, and five, act quickly. Next slide, please. Our work through the framework is grounded in facts and beliefs that housing instability and homelessness are intricately linked to long-standing racial disparities and have been amplified during the pandemic. So nowhere is, um, is this more true than for children and families and we are calling on every community to take steps necessary to ensure no child sleeps outside. Next slide, please. So we have strong, we have a strong program plan today and we will begin with a brief overview of the report um, by Barb. Um, then we will shift to a panel discussion that will include leaders from three organizations that we spotlighted in the report along with Alexis and me. The panel will be co-moderated by Joe Savage and Tabitha Blackwell. So we will take your questions during, that part, during this part of today's dialogue. Um, please use the Q&A box to share your questions for our esteemed panel of experts. And I now turn the program over to Barb to share highlights of our reports. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, hello, everyone. Bar Poppy here. I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, and it's good to be uh, with you today. I'm going to try to get us through the report fairly quickly because I am so excited for the panel that's coming up. But we did want to ground you in this report, uh, which we see as very important because we know that currently there are too many families who are left on waiting lists for shelters or being turned away because their family configuration doesn't match the space that's available. So when I think about the urgency of children uh, sleeping in cars, in abandoned buildings, and other places not meant for human habitation, the topic that we're raising up really challenges every community to step forward. And we hope that 
we are going to bring you some practical ways to do that that uh, have been working in other communities. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, so uh, this uh, project team, which was really extraordinary to be a part of, um, we came together and looked at the research that we had done, which included a massive, uh, a good number of interviews um, and profiles that we're gonna share with you. Uh, and we came to conclusion that there were six key practices that we wanted to lift up in this, in this space for families with children. First of all, the importance of capacity for all families of all types and configurations, that it's really important to center equity and culture in every element of planning and programming. There are flexible opportunities to use hotels and motels and master leases that have been tested through the pandemic and have found to be very successful. And the importance of offering alternatives to falling into homelessness through homelessness diversion across every point of contact in uh, community responses. And that it's really important that sheltering assistance is connected to rehousing and getting families to stability as quickly as possible. And that because families have a broad array of needs, they need uh, the homelessness assistance should be embedded within the broader community system of services and support. We're going to talk through this um, a little bit, um, each of these six areas, but I encourage you to read the report, uh, which is available online, along with two video introductions and a community summary. So there's a lot of resources online that we're not going to be able to cover today. Next slide. Uh, we uh, were, when we went out to develop this document, we wanted to identify organizations that exemplified some either promising or best practices. And we had some pretty stringent criteria. We interviewed over 30 communities, um, considered over 30 communities, and then we narrowed it down to the list um, that you can see on the screen today. And we were looking for communities or organizations had the ability to rapidly expand and contract based on changes in demand that offered dignity-based, safe, low barrier, temporary options, that amplified racial justice and equity practices and were deeply engaged with families in designing, planning, implementing and evaluating programs. So really important characteristic. We also wanted programs that were family centered, that were based on making things as easy and convenient as possible to the families. Of course, the importance of trauma informed design and practices as well as accommodating a range of family definitions was critical and using housing first with a harm reduction approach so they can quickly and effectively serve families by providing bridges to long-term housing. And we wanted to see communities and programs that really prioritized unsheltered families to get out of the streets um, and into safe places and reduce returns to homelessness. In all, we identified these nine spotlight organizations some of which are um, broad-based community efforts and some of them are smaller nonprofit um, specific um, interventions. So really exceptional group. Today we have three of those organizations joining us. All nine are really extraordinary. Let's go to the next slide. So our first principle was the importance of ensuring capacity to serve all families. And what I wanna really call out here is one of the important criteria um, amongst this list is really that families get to define their household, defining who they consider to be family and that those families can come together and stay together. We also wanted to be sure that programs aren't putting up artificial barriers based on legal status, criminal history, or perhaps because they've been homeless before, they might be excluded from the program. We did not wanna have those kind of programs. We also wanted to make sure that the programs that were making this flexible crisis option available, we're making it convenient and accessible to families and not requiring families to travel long distances nor be put on wait lists for services. Next slide. We really wanna call out um, the importance of um, all communities and programs adhering to HUD's equal access rule, which is not only a best practice, but it actually is required. And what we um, heard in many of the interviews is that there were communities that were 
not assuring full accommodations of families without regard to gender and age. And so in this report, we continue to reinforce the importance of making um, family shelter um, equally accessible to all families, uh, regardless of what their family household composition is. Next slide. Um, of course, for us, it's really important to center equity and culture throughout every element of planning and programming. As we interviewed uh, communities, we came up with many ways, and I'm, you're going to hear some of those today. And I just want to call out that it really is important for every program um, to really uh, be attentive to the diverse cultural identities of people served by the programs and systems, as well as looking at who is not uh, utilizing your services and systems that probably is eligible because you may not have a um, created a true equity and uh, culturally competent um, a set of services. Uh, one of the ways to do this is through better engagement with people with lived expertise, expertise to uh, identify the types of culturally specific programming that should be offered and ensure those thoughts are part of your planning and funding decisions um, as you create your programs and approaches. And um, there are many ways to be able to offer culturally specific approaches and new partnerships to build. We encourage every program serving families to think deeply in the ways you can center equity and culture. Next slide. Uh, there are some additional ideas on this slide because we just felt it was so important. Um, I wanna call out that we learned through this process that as you think through who your partners are, you want to also be sure that they share the same values that they do and that you're not partnering with organizations that perhaps um, aren't based on equity and uh, culturally, uh, culturally aware programming. An example would be some communities try to partner with the child welfare services, but oftentimes Child Protective um, is taking a very punitive um, and racist uh, approach to providing services and supports to families. So you need to think through carefully how you are um, engaging with your partners as well is to be sure that they bring the same values that you have established for your program. Next slide. Um, here's a great quote from uh, Noreen Hill, who is the founder of Mother Nation. Her uh, colleague Ruben Twin is with us today. And uh, I think it just really speaks to the importance. Um, and what she said was, indigenous people need access to our cultural practices to heal. Mother Nature Nation celebrates and inspires the ancestral strength of each participant through cultural services combined with housing assistance. And later today, you're gonna hear from Ruben about what those practices are and the impact they're having. Next slide. Um, Obviously, one of the most straightforward ways to offer flexible crisis options is through hotels and motels or vouchers. We also learned that some communities, and you're going to hear um, from one of those communities today, is using master lease units. What is important when you do this is to be very thoughtful about thinking through the geography of where this crisis option will be available and that it meets the needs of the family. You want to look for locations that are family friendly and are supportive to um, uh, safety as well as health and well-being of children. You wanna be able to accommodate families, including their pets and their family members, and for the families to have 24 seven access to this, not be shut out um, during parts of the day. Um, be sure to offer a full complement of services um, available on-site or remotely at the family's preference and choice and include transportation and uh, good connections to the community, making sure that all basic needs are met. Next slide. So one of the uh, principles that we have is um, that, and we certainly uncovered this through the Spotlight Communities, is the importance of problem solving together to mediate conflict and create a tailored individualized plan from a variety of flexible and interchangeable tools. So it's very important to um, make sure that every family has their unique plan. Uh, safety is certainly central, um, uh, and it's important to create spaces that have everyone feel and be safe um, so they can actually thrive. Next slide. Homeless aversion was a key um, uh, 
process that was lifted up by all of our nine uh, spotlight communities about providing uh, brief assistance that is comprehensive and assist families to identify resources that they can access as well as provide the kind of supports to stabilize their family. Every one of the nine communities does homelessness diversion and you can hear more about that when we get to our panel. Next slide. And then the fourth key finding was the importance of implementing diversion uh, and wanna encourage you to uh, think about every point of contact that can be made to offer this diversion assistance. It's highly valued by the families, but it should not be forced upon them. It should be a choice to access that. There's some great information about diversion um, for domestic violence housing first approaches, and that link is in the document. We encourage you to check out that resource. Next slide. Um, supporting transitions to stable housing is critical. We can't say this enough. Um, but so it's really important when you do your flexible options, whether you're doing master leases or hotel motel or vouchers, that you're providing the families access to the types of housing supports they need to exit as quickly as possible. Um, you can see it's a broad array uh, of, of assistance from just flexible financial assistance to rapid resolution, housing navigation support, rapid rehousing, affordable rental housing, and permanent supportive housing. Um, but for this housing assistance, families will not be able to exit from the flexible crisis option. And it's important that the flexible crisis option is viewed as a way for families to obtain housing, not just an alternative to shelter, but a way to help families get connected. Next slide uh, talks a little bit more about some of the strategies and importance that are using. Um, we wanna call attention to the importance of a housing first orientation, uh, actually helping the families locate the housing, um, negotiating with the landlord, supporting them in all ways, and taking um, a, a, a willingness to get them linked to the community-based resources that will help the families be stable over time. Next slide. Uh, the final key finding is the importance of embedding homelessness assistance within broader community system of services and supports. Uh, this came up time and time again, both from uh, my co-authors uh, who said it's not enough just to give somebody a place to stay overnight. They actually need connected to the types of resources their children need or other families need. And it's important for the, the program to be able to make those connections, whether it's a school or education or transportation, um, health, but making sure the comprehensive family needs are met through your intervention. Next slide. So I, I know this gets to be daunting to think about all of the ways we want to see communities and programs being improved. But uh, one of the reasons we put together the nine communities was to learn from them, but also to offer some practical tips. And you can see they're at geographically diverse locations um, and all sizes of communities. So we hope they resonate with you. Next slide. So we know every community enters into this. There's no one size fits all approach. Um, you may be a community that has a really strong continuum of care or other system led response to family homelessness, but you haven't uh, yet met all of the kind of the vision that we have in this to provide flexible crisis options. Well, we uh, identified three spotlight communities that are doing that, Washington DC, Cleveland Cuyahoga County, who will be on the panel today, and Greater Richmond, Virginia. It may be that you're listening in from an organization that you currently offer a full array of responses to families, kind of have your own in-house continuum. Um, we'd encourage you to expand and improve that to include flexible crisis options. And one of our um, spotlight organizations based in Dallas, Texas, Family Gateway has been able to do that. Or perhaps you are an organization that provides crisis assistance for families um, and you could actually partner with some other organizations to expand the community resources. Um, Hope Atlanta, Georgia, and Mother Nation Seattle are two really great examples of how they partner with other organizations to make the reach go further. Next slide. Or perhaps your organization is a culturally specific organization um, so you're often seeing families who may be excluded um, from the traditional homeless response system. 
Um, perhaps there's a way you could meet some community gaps. And uh, we've got three organizations that have stepped in to fill some of those gaps. Um, one of those is Asian Americans for Community Involvement in Santa Clara County, uh, Mother Nation in Seattle, and then Rainbow Services in Los Angeles. Um, the next type of organization is perhaps you are an organization that is, um, serves um, domestic and interpersonal violence. In that case, we direct you to look to these three organizations that are uh, based in that um, practice and how they've provided flexible crisis options. Again, Asian Americans uh, for community investment, for community involvement, Mother Nation and Rainbow Services are all DVIPV specific organizations. And then finally, maybe you're a community operating um, in the rural areas. And we've got a great speaker joining us today um, from the Hoob Aqua uh, Community Action um, in Minnesota. Um, and they've done some really innovative pieces. Our hope is that by kind of giving you kind of a pathway that you could follow, everyone who's on this call can figure out a way in your program, in your community, in your system, that you can expand flexible options and better meet the needs of families who experience homelessness. Next slide. So um, any of you who know me, as well as know Sharon McDonald from the National Alliance, you know that we wouldn't wanna uh, leave a document without making some policy suggestions. I wanna just say that Tiffany and Alexa, our other two co-authors are activists and advocates on policy as well. And so between us, we constructed both inter um, immediate near-term actions that you can take. And then the, um, I'm gonna get to the next slide and we'll talk about some longer term. Um, so the first call to action we have is to build equity into your policy and funding decisions now. Second is to recognize and dismantle punitive systems and program policies that impede and police black families and other families of color. We know too often these families are excluded from programs um, and over policing of black and brown families um, has tremendous harm. We also encourage you to think about the places that you can identify and increase flexible funding to meet the unique and self-defined needs of families. Ensuring that your family, your policy and funding supports truly support housing first approaches that are inclusive, holistic and trauma informed. And finally, ensure that all funding and all policies are accountable for meeting each family's unique needs. Uh, we believe every community, every program, every service can take this mantle up and move forward quickly on these areas. They should be within reach. Next slide looks at more of the systemic actions that will require persistent advocacy. And we encourage you to be a part of these efforts that will stop criminalizing and policing the activities of black and brown people, who as you know, are overrepresented among those experiencing homelessness. We encourage you to work to eradicate barriers to um, assistance for immigrant and undocumented family members. We heard quite a bit of this in our interviews about the importance of serving this population and not having them be excluded. Uh, but that will take some um, changes to policy and perhaps laws. We encourage you to increase the supply of deeply affordable rental housing, expand rental assistance and access and remove barriers to safe and stable housing. I've heard that there's some big housing bill being considered um, at Congress right now that would make immense changes here um, and make um, housing much more broadly available in our country, a really important uh, possibility. We also um, in, in, expect, uh, increase uh, support for policies that raise families' incomes and promote economic stability, and certainly the importance of expanding capacity of community and public social service programs for families experiencing housing crisis to actually avoid eviction to avoid the loss of housing and to avoid homelessness. We know these are tall charges, but we hope you'll join with us in continued advocacy in your community and across the country um, to really uh, be better advocates for children and families to meet their unique um, and important needs. Next slide. Whew, made it. Um, <laughs> so at this time, um, 
I don't know if there's any, uh, I just wanna encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. We can try to get those answered. I'll do some of those online, uh, but we might be able to surface them in the next section. I do encourage you to read the full report that we put together. There's a uh, kind of a key uh, points document. And then, as I said, there's two videos that also support this work. So we hope these begins and continues the conversation. I just also wanna call out that we did two documents last year that were a call to action as we were seeing families and children were not having their needs fully addressed in the pandemic. And those are good resource guides as well. All of those are available at the framework website. Next slide. So with this, I am going to turn this over to the really um, fun and exciting part of the program. I am so happy that we are joined um, by Tabitha Blackwell with Funders Together to End Homelessness and Joe Savage with the U.S. Interagency um, Council on Homelessness. Um, and um, I'm gonna turn it over to them and they're gonna take us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, for it, the amazing introduction and all of the information that you provided. Um, my name is Tabitha Blackwell, and I am with, um, I'm Director of Networks and Programs with Funders Together to End Homelessness, and I'll let Joe introduce himself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Joe Savage. I am with the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, and I serve as one of five regional coordinators based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hey to all my Philly folks. Beautiful. Well, we are excited to have an amazing group of panelists join us today. Some of them you've already heard from um, and others Barb has teased. So we're excited to um, introduce, uh, starting with our panelists you've already heard from, which is Tiffany um, and Alexis Kramer, who she discussed as being the co-author. Um, Alexis Kramer is from Minnesota area and Tiffany, of course, as she mentioned, is from the Virginia area. We also have three amazing organizations um, that have representatives here that will have the opportunity to hear from. Um, the first is Liz, Liz Coppola, um, who is with um, Mojave Ottawa Community Action um, Partnership in Minnesota. Their organization, you'll get to hear um, a lot of the amazing works they're doing in the Detroit Lakes and surrounding area. Um, we have Melissa Sirik and Allison Gill, who is with Cleveland Cahoga County um, Continuum of Care in Ohio, um, based there, right with Barb and a lot of the work that they're doing. And then finally, Ruben Twin, who is with Mother Nation in Seattle, Washington. And so with that, I'll just Briefly have them give a brief overview of the work that they're doing um, to introduce themselves as well. And we'll start with Liz. Thank you so much, Liz Kwapala, Indigenous Cause, Iron Range, Indunjaba, Earhart, Inda, Gawin, Indigosi. That's I'm just introducing myself in Ojibwe, not because I'm Ojibwe, but because we work closely with the Ojibwe community and live and work on lands um, long stewarded by Ojibwe peoples. Um, so a couple of quick things about Mahabi. Um, I think I'm doing this now, right? Yeah. A um, couple of quick things about Mahabi Awa. We, um, uh, we have the master lease and hotel motel stays and it works really well in our rural area. We serve 5,000 square miles. And I think maybe the next slide I might say a little bit about us, but uh, 5,000 square miles in rural Minnesota. So it is real, would be really hard to build a shelter when there's a, a bunch of small towns of a couple hundred or a couple thousand people. And so we have some master lease units in the larger communities, and then we're able to pair them with hotel motels as there's, as there's more need. Another thing we do um, as part of our strategy is we're a community action agency. And so we're really focused on upward mobility. And so we think of folks coming in at one of five levels and we're really helping people with this entire upward mobility journey. So it's highlighted in the report, but I'll just summarize quickly. Someone comes to us in crisis, a homeless crisis. Um, we resolve that as quickly as we can with an emergency 
support or diversion or, or something. But then level two is benefits. We, we try to get this family connected with all of the public and private resources that are available to them. Um, and then that moves them to level three, relationship-based coaching, if they're interested, to just kind of help on a long-term goal, either an education pathway goal, employment pathway, or something else. As we talked with families, they said, the big thing I'm working on is my cancer diagnosis or getting my kids back from foster care or you know, something. So we want to support them with relation based, relationship based coaching best we can. Um, as they're working through that, um, then we move to asset building level four. And this is assets, not just the financial assets, but also connection to culture, connection to friends and family network, faith community, just broadly defined um, array of options. However, the family defines assets themselves. And then level five is leadership development, peer counseling, peer support, volunteerism, those kinds of things. And we feel like as, as folks are able to climb these five levels, they're less likely to um, fall back into poverty. Um, we do it in a whole family two-generation approach. And that's Mahabi Atwa. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, and we will head over to our, our next organization. So I'll turn it over to Melissa and Allison. Uh, Melissa, you're still on mute. My apologies. I should know by now. Good afternoon, all. <laughs> Melissa Surratt with Cuyahoga County Office of Homeless Services in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, Ohio provides a full continuum of services to families facing homelessness using a progressive engagement approach to support no child placed outside. You'll see noted on the slide that we reference our coordinated entry process and our approach to resource matching. So we really work extremely diligently to match the family's needs to the most appropriate resource. Strategic use of funding has allowed for significant investment in prevention and diversion activities at the front door of our system. This allowed our COC to meet the needs of all families without expanding shelter capacity throughout most of 2020. You'll also see that a strategic utilization of resources has allowed our CSC to provide the flexible crisis options that are noted here, diversion, mediation case management, legal services, diversion in the form of gift cards, cash incentives, landlord incentives, and as previously mentioned by Barb, hotel, the usage of hotel and motel. Additional options were later provided through hotel and motel vouchers and an overflow shelter program offering families in a non-congregate setting with 24-7 security. Several years ago, the Continuum of Care adopted the Housing First approach that states any individual or family is ready for housing if provided with the appropriate support. This means that all our projects are low barrier, all families are provided safe and appropriate access to shelter, and there are no documentation barriers with respect to obtaining services. Client choice is always at the forefront of what they do. Families are intricately involved in their own plan and their own choice and options. All families receive a short long-term housing plan at coordinated intake. You'll see here we reference our progressive engagement model, which provides families with additional assistance based on their needs and what it takes in order for them to be housed. They complete their housing plan at coordinated intake. That's then reassessed by shelter case managers during the shelter stay and specific weekly meetings are held within the COC shelter, rapid rehousing, and PSH providers to facilitate the housing plan for families. Typically in our continuum, all families are rehoused in 70 days, and we recently expanded our rehouse, rapid rehousing program to better support families in the form of 12 months of rental assistance. Also, significant efforts are being made, made to bridge many of those families over to permanent subsidy. I would lastly add that we do all this, not only through the Housing First approach and the progressive engagement model, but we do this through an equitable lens. Youth providers in partnership with the Race Equity Lab are helping the entire system expand and intensify the system's focus on race equity. We found that a significant percentage of our families are parenting youth. In addition to this, we've updated our advisory board's governance charter and bylaws and added seats to better reflect the population that we're serving here in our continuum. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and our final um, group that we'll have introduced before we jump into our questions is Mother Nation. And that, so Ruben, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ruben Quinn. Uh, I'm an Oglala Lakota from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and I'm currently out here in Seattle, Washington, uh, working with our tribal members with their programs out here and assistance for uh, housing out here. Mother Nation was founded by Noreen Hill, and she's an Oneida a tribal member from Canada and also in, there in uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, she's been out here for some years and found that there's a need. Um, we have a lot of good services here in Seattle. We have the Chief Seattle Club, um, which serves the population down on the streets. Um, we have the United Indians, uh, which was founded through the American Indian Movement to take over uh, of, of the lands, bringing that back through uh, Bernie White Bear. And we also have a uh, Seattle Indian Center, which also serves the street populations as well. And then we have Seattle Indian Health Board. Um, our current one that also just joined on in the community is the College Tribal Health Program, provides mental health and SUD services or chemical dependency services. And so what Noreen started realizing was that between all of our services, there tends to be gaps between our services and how do we meet those gaps? Um, because every, every organization has their, their things, their mission that they're trying to work with but there are individuals who do fall between these gaps and how do we begin to service the ones that are not meeting those, those needs that, uh, that are organizations. So she founded Mother Nation to actually step forward and to try to meet those needs. Um, the primary part of it is the Howie, which is an Oneida word for protecting her sacred, which is our domestic violence advocacy program. And in that she started realizing that there was a need for housing. And so we moved into the housing resources um, using diversion and homeless prevention and aftercare and cultural, then identifying the culture services that need to be in that process. Um, and we started doing outreach currently, um, getting the tribal members, because we work with the Muckleshoot tribe, the Puyallup tribe, the Tilelup, the Snoqualmie, and the Snohomish, and the tribal members that are out here. So how do we begin to service those ones that can't be you know, serviced by those tribes? So we outreach within the partnership with the natives that are in those tribes, but are not registered with those tribes. So we can provide those services well. Um, so we partner with the, the medical, with the Seattle Indian Health Board when we find those needs um, as we do the case management. You know, uh, sometimes we look at the housing for Chief Seattle Club with the all, all program that they have currently and housing Native Americans within that the property that they currently developed, you know, and other resources that sometimes we might not have that because of contracts. Um, and Noreen decided to go with low barrier contracts. And so what that means is that um, some of the paperwork and all the stuff that is needed to get the contracts sometimes, you know, bogs us down with our services. So she's elected to, you know, only select contracts that allow us the, the flexibility and the freedom to provide services, you know, that are culturally appropriate and culturally driven and actually uh, meet the needs of the people without having to go through all of the, the, the paperwork and the red tape and that stuff and to provide that services and to justify why those services are need to be met there and the best practices you know to identify best practices when um, initially out here in Seattle we had what they call the gang of four which said that we can all provide services for our people because we're the best ones to service our people not to isolate us or to segregate us or to make us against each other but to identify that we know the needs of our people and we can you know meet those needs of our people because we're coming from our people uh, so we had you know, Bernie Whitebeard for the Native Americans. We have um, uh, Mr. Uh, Bob Santos for the Asian community. You know, we have Larry Gossett for the Black Panthers, the African American community, you know, and um, uh, Robert Del Santos for the, the Hispanics and Latinos out here with Del Santo. Um, so we have organizations that we partnership with outside of the Native American community because we're all connected as they say BIPOC. So we're connected together. So we try to meet those needs. Um, we do everything from a cultural perspective and we use cultural practices and we use like uh, medicines and smudging, uh, cedar um, teachings. We also have groups. So once they're engaged with us, they can stay with us. And so we have support groups that identify with sexual assault, domestic violence, um, elders that are out there that are also needed services, uh, a women's group and a men's group. So that way they can engage in those services and continue support as well. So we kind of do like a wraparound service, but we partner with a lot of organizations out here to meet that need because sometimes they can't be seen or sometimes they haven't had that connection so we make those connections with them and uh, most of our staff and uh, I think all of our staff is Native American and we all attend ceremonies and we're from different tribes so we actually bring in the tribal differences from all of our tribes to just kind of work together with the 
people coming through. So that's Mother Nation. Thank you so much and welcome again to all of our panelists. We're now going to move into our uh, question and discussion period uh, with our panelists. And we're going to kick it off with our first question. We're going to ask each panelist to take no more than two minutes. And we're going to go in the following order. Uh, first, we'll have Alexis, followed by Liz, then Melissa, along with Allison. And then finally, we'll conclude with Ruben. And so our first question is, what themes most resonate with you from the report? Alexis. Hi, all. Um, thank you for that. My name is Alexis Kramer. Um, as they stated, I am also the co-author that's been helping with this project. Um, I would say what resonates with me most from the project is um, being able to share my experience about child protection. Um, there's a lot of things that people don't know about child protection. Um, and I understand that all experiences are different, um, but something that I feel that needs to be shared is that uh, in terms of no child sleeping outside, um, there are some people out there that have like a dilemma, like a stereotype against parents as you will. Like if, you know, the parents are sleeping with their children and they know the parents and the children, they know their names and everything, then that will come into a child protection report. And a lot of people think that child protection aren't supposed to be, you know, targeting people because they're homeless and they're, and it shouldn't be a reason to take children away, but they do. Um, and that is what I'm really excited about and why I joined this project is because I've had lived experience of being homeless, mostly because I dealt with child protection in the past and I still am. I'm fighting for my two children right now and I'm having issues navigating through the system, having a hard time getting a job and trying to get housing and can't get those things because I'm dealing with child protection because they are blocking me from all those things. So I just wanted to put that out there and um, yeah, and I'm ready for the next question if there is, or if it's going to the next person. Thanks, Alexis. Um, this is Liz. I'll, um, I wanted to just jump in. I saw a question pop up about how does a master lease work? And so it's really pretty simple. It's just we um, we rent some apartments in our own name, in the organization's name. So it's like we're the tenant. We have an agreement with the landlord that we can move families in and out of there. And we just kind of sublease. It's just between us and the family. We're moving in and out of these units. And it allows them to stay 30, 60, 90 days um, you know, whatever, whatever the family needs and we work with. So it's just the organization rents the apartment and has that agreement with the landlord. A couple of themes that really stood out for me was building a family centered approach. And for us, it really meant we had previously, just because we, like so many other organizations, we were living in kind of a scarcity mindset where there was never enough money to meet all of the needs. And too many, you know, there's just never enough. And we're just trying to keep up with all of the rules and regulations. And so it was like the funder was we were putting the funder at the center of everything. And that that meant we sometimes screen families out because they're like, oh no, we, we don't know if we can afford, you know, like or what we had all of these kind of excuses. And so what what we decided to do was put families in the center of our work. And then we work with funders, we communicate with funders and stuff, but it's allowed us to try to seek flexible resources, educate funders on where some of their rules and regulations aren't working for our families. And so each family, we look at the family and try to figure out what, what best serves that family, along with, you know, within some guiding principles, of course. So we've created you know, everything from some uh, special pot of barrier elimination funds to just, if there's anything that can be fixed with money, let's try to fix that. That Those are easy challenges. And, um, and incentive funds. So when someone is making progress on really hard to reach goals, we can support them with things that they're going to need anyway. Gas cards, grocery coupon, you know, um, gift certificates or whatever. Instead of like having them come to us and ask like, hey, can I get gas cards for another week? We kind of are able to um, put the family at the center and kind of support what they want to do and, and build up supports around that. 
So that that was um, a good takeaway. I would say this whole report is really positive and uh, encouraging to just know there's so many approaches that work in every kind of community. Um, it's it's good and positive that way. I do want to lift up to the stop criminalizing black and brown people. And I say this as a white person and speak to, especially to other white people. I think the way homeless services were created in this country was very much in a charity sort of model where, um, you know, it was people donating their time to help people. Some of that came from very much a faith-based approach, some from a social work kind of approach, but sometimes it still results in um, kind of wanting to be thanked or wanting to feel good or kind of provide a charity. And we need to change that whole mindset because that, when that, when we're doing it from that sort of charity model, um, I think it sometimes leads us to thinking about individuals. And when we think about individuals instead of systems, um, we get into trouble. And so balancing that a systems approach, but then putting its families in the center um, is, has been a huge path forward for us and continues to inspire me. With that, I'll pass the next to Melissa or Allison. Thank you. Um, Cuyahoga County has a pretty comprehensive system that has a robust workflow that has supported our, our community well for years. With that said, um, with that foundation in place, I think the cultural sensitivity is really what resonated with me the most out of the report. Um, it's this foundation, I think, that will allow us to really propel forward and, and do our cultural, more cultural sensitivity work and really drilling down on how we serve everyone in our homeless community. Um, I think it's gonna allow us to further look at our cultural responsiveness of our system and what that looks like and who we're serving and who we're not serving. Um, I think our continuum believes strongly in involving those that we serve, whether it's a policy discussion, the practices that we have, the services that we provide. So we really look to having the right people at the table and, and serving our community in the right way. And with that, I'll look to Allison. Yeah, I think that's great. Thanks, Melissa. I, I think too, um, really looking at outcomes across the board for the BIPOC community and, and LGBTQ and, and looking at how we can really target efforts to address their specific needs. Um, and, you know, one of the main takeaways for me, you know, is really being able to have a flexible system, not only a flexible crisis response or, or options for families, but, but the system as a whole, being able to adapt quickly to those needs and, and just throughout that collaboration, providing flexibility with your programming. All right, and finally, Ruben. Uh, the one thing that kind of really stuck out with me is, is the cultural awareness part, uh, the need for cultural awareness. Um, and kind of, I come from a, back, a counseling background. I've done that for 20 years, but I started out with the homeless prevention with Downtown Emergency Service Center and using a harm reduction in regards to getting our, our people, our relations sheltered. And when I say relations, I mean those that are of other ethnicities are still our relations because we're the two-legged species. So when we talk about relations, you know, how do we begin to service our relations and how do we begin to look at that process? And um, the culture is really important to understand the culture. And we always say best practices, but most people don't understand through historical trauma and through intergenerational trauma that there's a huge trust when it comes to the system. You know, and seeing somebody that is that looks like you, somebody that comes from where you come from, somebody that talks like you do and has that background and awareness, it can actually, you know, bridge that gap of trust. And, and I think that's the one thing that as we go out there and start doing more historical intergenerational trauma. And right now we went through a huge piece with um, MMIW you know, uh, missing, murdered Indigenous women and people of color, you know, and how that impacts our community. And then currently we're also dealing with the boarding schools with the children, you know, that are being found within the boarding school systems that are now being, you know, returned to home that were, you know, put into the boarding schools. And those are our, our ancestors or grandparents and stuff that didn't make it home. So we have this historical trauma and then we understand, um, you know, the high, the process of uh, Kubler Ross and grief and loss, we're still dealing with that the five stages of grief and loss and how that relates to our culture, how that relates to us as a population and a people. 
you know, and then when we look at the homelessness, um, you know, how are we beginning to you know, remove people from camps when they're Native Americans and this is their land to begin with, you know, and now we're having to remove them again, you know, goes right back to that historical, that piece where, you know, settlers come across this country and decide to remove Native Americans because, you know, they're a nuisance and they're, you know, they're out there, they're being a, a distraction, you know, we needed that, that piece of land to, you know, to, you know, to farm and to, you know, to, you know, build our, our, you know, what we wanted to build and to put Native Americans on reservations and, and tribal lands and stuff. And so how do we begin to look at that piece and that these pieces that these people are carrying with them, but have no real beginning to understand why they're angry, you know, why they're displaced and, you know, and why there's alcoholism and drug addiction. And the other piece that stands out for me too is the CPS, because once you have those disorders, you know, and then you're involved with Child Protective Services, Indian Child Welfare, you know, and to understand Indian child welfare was put in place so our kids don't go into the CPS system, you know, because of that boarding school process, but having agencies and, and organizations to understand that you can't reach out to, you know, when you come across Native Americans that, you know, we're going to be a part of, you know, ICW, Indian child welfare, that there's a different set of laws and a different set of things that have to come with that, you know, and to reach out to organizations that might have that knowledge to better work with that population or the individual that coming forward that identifies as a native or a tribal member to, to really connect with them. I think that's what stands out mostly for me is that, you know, uh, the CPS part, but, you know, understanding that there's a need for uh, Indian child welfare that needs to be, you know, also recognized as well, because that relates to a lot of the things that we're dealing with in regards to housing pieces too. And then the culture, just driving home the culture. I really appreciate that. You know, because that's best practices and, you know, how are you supposed to know best practices if we don't trust you to allow you to come in and see our ceremonies? How do you know what our ceremonies are like because you've never been in our ceremony because that distrust. So we're not going to let you in. So you can't make best practices out of our ceremony because we've, we safeguarded that based on historical trauma. So I really emphasize, you know, us as tribal members to kind of also build that side of our bridge you know, as our partners start to build their side of the bridge so we can connect in the middle and really start to heal our people. You know, when I say our people, I mean all of our people of color and people, you know, of, you know, descendancies of European descent and, you know, of our other relations as well. If I can share that. Thank you, Ruben. And it is such a, such a layered issue and there's so much systematic, cultural, and just so much depth to um, the issues and the report really does outline a lot of things and it has this amazing, you know, it has this challenge to each community to ensure no child sleeps outside. And so what are some practical next steps you hope organizations take to realize that vision? And we can start with Melissa and Allison and move to Ruben and then Liz for that. Thank you. Um, I would first highly suggest uh, communities enacting the Housing First philosophy with an intentional focus on client choice in all services and for all populations. Um, communities should work to have services um, that are tailor-made and seek a tailor, tailored resources and services approach that are unique and specific to families. Um, families come to us with a um, multi-layer of needs, including anything from ensuring children are in school, daycare, employment, mental health and addiction, um, needs just an array of services that really should be tailored to that family with their choice. They should be extremely and highly involved in their plan. I would also suggest that they should analyze their current um, and potential resources to identify the gaps and better serve their community. So what needs are not being met um, for BIPOC population or LGBTQ population and what resources can we pull into the community, especially those that are most flexible in order to better meet their needs. I would lastly also say that um, we should focus on housing stability. Um, Barb spoke to this a little bit and, and look at a more holistic approach. So again, people come to us um, with many needs, not just housing. So looking at an individual and serving them spiritually, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and what needs do they have so that we can ensure that they are housing secure and living their fullest life. Right, Allison, did you have have anything else? Um, it, most of the, did a great job covering that. I mean, the only other thing I would add is the importance of including persons with lived experience in your policy conversations. You know, making sure they're part of those discussions and part of the decision making. Um, if, that, if that's, you know, that is a critical um, next step for organizations. 
absolutely. Ruben, your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are um, kind of like what we do here at Mother Nation is we do uh, cultural sensitivity training. And so we, you know, if I can you know, share and encourage people, it's a partnership. Um, we reach out to other non-Native organizations, you know, and to collaborate with them and say, you know, should you come across one of our tribal members? And sometimes they don't want to be served by our, you know, another tribal organization and they prefer mainstream and, and that that's good for them because at least they're engaging services. But should they, you know, have some hookups or some barriers that they reach out, you know, and, and start to identify those, you know, culturally appropriate services within their community and to reach out to them, you know, and if they're not transfer them over and to work with them, and, you know, in tandem, you know, and that's what we do with Mother Nation is that with our organizations that we don't just take them and case manage them and stop with that other organization. No, we actually work in conjunction with that organization to support that person there because they're the first ones that had first contact with them. And so we only support that in regards to um, some of the needs that are not being met by that organization in regards to cultural stuff. Or sometimes we collaborate and we explain why that person is experiencing these kind of like behaviors and, you know, and some of the things that they might have experienced. And so sometimes like with our domestic violence, um, you know, we get referrals from other organizations. So if I can say, you know, just partnershiping with organizations and identify organizations within your community that meet the needs of the BIPOC community. And because it's a collaboration of all of us working together. Uh, we come from a Native American perspective of the medicine wheel when we look at the black, the white, the yellow, and the red, you know, we're the two-legged species, so we all have to work together here, otherwise at some point in time we won't be here. Um, you know, and just the four-legged and the swimmers and the crawlers and the, the ones that fly will be left if we don't work together. So it's about us working together to make sure that we, you know, take care of one another and stuff. And so if I can put that out there in the collaboration and just trauma-informed care, you know, and trainings within the organization. Um, and it's, you know, part of your continuing education and you, know, you license up with your, your, your license requirements to bring those people in. So if I can just encourage that. And I just um, thank you for that. And I just add, I think just setting that bold vision and communicating it often in the community to every sector, no child should sleep outside in our community. I think that's a vision people can get behind community leaders. Um, I think for us in our very rural area, sometimes families who we think of as homeless, like they're in their car or they're outside in a tent, they don't think of themselves as homeless. And so we're always trying to figure out how do we message this? How do we talk about it? So that people who we're trying to reach see themselves. So much of like movies and television and stuff shows homelessness as an urban issue. And so in our rural areas, we'll talk to a family who's living in their car and they'll say, no, we're just car camping until we can get back on our feet. And so part of the challenge for no child sleeping outside, I think is, is really trying to figure out how to reach the people we're trying to reach in ways that speak to them. And so I think that's engaging family voice, um, listening directly to them. And um, that's helpful with our hotel. So we've got master lease is our, uh, primary place where we like to house people and then um just because it's it's um our families tell us it's a little more humane going to an apartment they can you know get everything together there while they're there for 30 days or whatever it takes um when the when those units are full then we use hotel motel stays and um so we can like expand and contract as needed and so for during slower times when our staff aren't busy working with families in many hotels and motel stays, they're still employed for us. And so we do outreach, outreach to school districts and county partners and faith communities and just, just the whole array of services. And I think as we build those connections, as Ruben stated so beautifully, um, I think that too can build just such a cohesive network of support so strong that no child will fall through the cracks. Clearly we have more work to do in our community, but um, excited to be part of it. Thank you. Great. Um, so one of the um, key objectives of the report is to really push uh, people to center equity and culture uh, in the work that they do in their programs and in their systems. So why is that important? And then what are some practical next steps you hope organizations take to center equity and culture? Why is it important? And what are some practical next steps you expect um, organizations to take? We'll start with Tiffany, followed by Ruben, then Liz, and conclude with Melissa and Allison. All righty. 
Um, so for me, I think it's important before taking the next step um, and really understanding. And I think um, a few of you all mentioned this before, like the historical trauma um, and history um, as it relates to just like even the um, topic around homelessness and how a lot of that was rooted in like uh, slavery um, and people being displaced um, during that period of time. For generations, like policies have shifted from how we want to take accountability as a collective around like um, homelessness and family and child welfare. Um, and there's been a lot of like um, also policy and stereotype in policy and practice around um, the cause of homelessness, um, some of which um, there has been policy in the past, um, really um, policy in the past stating that homelessness, if your family is homeless, it's because you sinned, right? Then there was um, things around, um, around uh, policy that criminalized families for being homeless, like vagrancy policies, what well, vagrancy laws, um, that came out of like the Jim Crow era um, that criminalized um, slaves um, for being homeless as a result of being released from slavery. Um, and so there's like this huge trend in connection between um, child welfare or like um, uh, system uh, involvement, um, criminalizing families and then housing instability and homelessness. Um, and for me, what I challenge programs to do is really examine some of their policies that they may feel like reinforces this. Um, for example, um, even just outside of the context of homelessness, when I hear conversations around equity um, and uh, transformational justice and reparations and what all of that would look like, a lot of those conversations are really exclusive. Um, of certain populations of people and the most highly impacted populations of people at that. Um, and so I've really just challenged programs to just review their policies. Um, for instance, like when I transitioned out of the child welfare system, um, me and my child was couch surfing, like experience, you know, experiencing housing instability. And um, the, I don't know if it was the director or Someone from DSS kept calling my phone asking me if I had housing, but I was smart enough to know not to answer that question truthfully. Why? Because I knew it would result in my child being removed from me, um, basically being penalized for my economic status or inability thereof um, to provide housing for me and my child. Um, and just really thinking about how there's a lot of intersections with populations who um, experience homelessness, like intersection and system involvement. Um, so not just like child welfare, but the criminal justice system, juvenile justice system, maybe even like the immigration um, justice system. Um, and when we're thinking about solutions to homelessness, being very thoughtful not to include exclude populations like immigrant populations, when we start thinking about like how people transition to America and you know what I'm saying, things like that, a lot of times people are not natives and a lot of reparations conversations are not um, centering those people who are impacted who don't have status right now. Um, and so when we talk about just like providing housing and uh, cultural and racial equity, providing service, offering service, offering resources and not penalizing families for maybe not accepting them because of the distrust um, in systems. Um, and so, like, if you have a program and you say, we offer this, this, and this, and a family is like, I want to accept this, but I don't want to accept these other things, respect that, you know, because the treatment or um, resources should be led by the families. It should be led by them. And you, as a, sis, as a program, if you penalize those families for not accepting all of what you may offer, what may happen is you reinforcing um, some of the systemic issues um, and practices that are happening on a broader scale. Um, in addition to that, um, offering a variety of housing options, because as mentioned earlier, someone was saying how some families may not see, you know, 
um, this as homelessness or may see housing and what that means differently. Like for some people, a home is a place to reside, um, a place to, you know what I'm saying, um, debrief, um, commune. Like housing means a lot to different people. So being mindful of that, um, when being mindful of that and including those people who are impacted in conversations on what housing should look like and how you should be developing those kind of um, programs. So not just policy conversations, but actual implementation and practice on the ground. Um, and then also like I challenge not just organizations, but um, states and governments to really re-examine some of those policies. Like those vagrancy laws are still in existence, like no loitering, no peeing outside. If I don't have a bathroom to go to, I'm going to pee outside. And so why are you criminalizing? I'm not saying I would, but why are you criminalizing people for surviving, if that makes any sense? Um, when we think about um, uh, things, it's a lot. So yeah. It, indeed, it is a lot. And, you know, this is a huge uh, topic and there's a lot of layers to it. And um, what I want to do is I want to keep us on time so that we get through um, our panel discussion. And if we have more time at the end with the Q&A, we'll come back um, to this topic. But I'm going to turn it into over to Tabitha for our next uh, panel question. Thank you, Joe. We've um, so listening to the report, I, one of the things that came up was diversion and rehousing. And so um, the report really emphasizes the importance of diversion and rehousing. How has your organization worked to increase access to diversion and ensure appropriate housing options? And I'm going to start with um, Melissa and, and Allison with that, and then we'll hear from Ruben and Liz. Uh, Cuyahoga County has robust uh, mediation services that have been paired up with our diversion at coordinated entry, so the front end of our whole system and the central access point for homeless services. Uh, we have uh, nationally recognized mediation services that are used both on the front of our, our system as well as while um, families are in shelter um, with the ultimate goal, of course, of avoiding entrance into our system at all and maintaining shelter residents while working on their housing plans. Um, our recent work has included looking at managing, I should say, looking at and managing ev eviction filings and making sure that we're uh, prioritizing interventions as soon as possible prior to that crisis happening. Um, during the pandemic, diversion efforts were increased to include the use of gift cards. So as they working, were working through mediation, gift card assistance was, was offered to assist in providing um, the residents which the individual was staying with some support. And, and receiving them and, and permitting them to continue to remain there. Um, we also use this method, method effectively and it was utilized for families not only seeking shelter that were currently in shelter as well um, to, to work on deconcentration of the family shelters. Homeless prevention was also able to be provided um, for the first time in many years in our continuum um, to have this flexible funding during the pandemic. It aided in housing security for families. We also offered housing incentives to families in shelter and currently waiting for rapid rehousing. Um, this assisted also in creating additional shelter space for families that were in need. Um, as mentioned earlier, we, we looked at our resources and our policies and we extended our rapid rehousing assistance to be up to 12 years of, of support for those families. And then I would also say that the, the braiding of public and private and federal resources is critical to address diversion and rehousing. And the flexibility of those resources are important to fill those gaps and the unique uh, needs of families that come into our community. Allison, would you have anything to add? Um, just, it's, we expanded to 12 months of subsidy and thank you. I do not have anything to add given the time. I will reserve my comments for the other uh, panelists. Thank you. Okay. Uh, real quickly, um, with Mother Nation, um, we look at funding sources and, and partnering with our funding and, you know, and having a dialogue with our funders. Uh, Mother Nation, like I said, we have other organizations that have bigger contracts and work with the city and the state and the federal. Um, with a lot of that comes a lot of bureaucracy. And so there's a lot of barriers to accessing those funds. Uh, Noreen has elected to make sure that we contact grantors um, and funders 
that have low barrier, you know, um, obstacles for us. And so then that way with the diversion and with the homeless prevention, um, we have, you know, open access really, and we have a, a low barrier access to providing services without having to go through all of that other process with other funders. Um, we've actually walked away from contracts in regards to, because it goes against our, our mission statement, which is culturally appropriate services. Um, and some of those requirements in those contracts go against our mission statement and being culturally focused and sensitive. Uh, so, and then when we have the funds, you know, and Noreen believes, and we all believe here that, you know, the creator will look after us because we're doing the work of the creator, you know, and so the funders will be there when we need them there for the work that needs to be done. And so we can walk away from contracts in regards to instead of trying to take a contract just to get the needs met. And then all of a sudden now we're obligated to do some services that go against our cultural mission and our purpose as a mother nation organization. Uh, so that's kind of what we do is we focus on our contracts and make sure that we have a low barrier access to our services, the diversion and homeless prevention. I just add, we have, we really are focused on what we think of our, as our whole family, whole agency, whole community approach. And so part of what that is, is we, we try to look at the whole family and the extended family. So a lot of, in addition to mediation with landlords and things we've heard already, um, really helping folks. I'm a, I'm a queer woman, I'm very aware of the concept in the LGBT community where the notion of chosen family is really important. I work in rural communities where you know, forever, we've needed all hands on deck to put up the hay in the fall or, you know, to harvest the gardens. And, you know, and so we do this as we look to our diversion efforts as well to see like, are there aunties or, you know, grandma or, you know, who, who do we have in your network? You might not be able to live with them, but they might be able to help with some part of it. They might be able to help with the kid with the childcare after school while we work on something else. And, and so we really look at that whole extended family and chosen family network and, and try to help people um, identify their strengths and assets that way. Sometimes it means they land in shelter for a little bit as we continue to figure that out. But um, it's my two cents on that, thanks. All right, thank you. We actually do have three minutes um, before we get to our um, Q&A to keep us on time. So if we could just get uh, one more, uh, maybe uh, Melissa or Allison to talk about what you think some practical next steps are around centering equity and culture. Thank you for that. Um, I would say to first look at your foundation, um, which usually starts with um, oftentimes your structure and your foundation, which could be at your advisory board. Um, so for instance, in Cuyahoga County, we did look at our OHS advisory board. We looked at the membership. You have to ask yourself the question is, are, are we re reflective of the community that we're serving or are we not? And if we're not, what do we do? So we looked at that individual membership of our board and we made modifications. We ensured that there were not only um, individuals that, that are highly represented in our community, the LGBT community as well as BIPOC, but we also looked at what systems are not around our table. So we included the criminal justice system, we included JFS, um, healthcare, et cetera. And so we reworked our membership. We also looked at um, what is determining who's involved in these conversations when they are a member. So we looked at our application for board members. We increased questions about diversity. We directly asked those questions and, and made that way heavier in our board membership when, when um, looking at uh, having board members join our team and, and having those candidates. We also developed um, a policy committee. So it's been mentioned throughout today the importance of policy and having um, individuals that were surveyed involved in that process. So through that policy committee, um, individuals with lived experience will be around the table. They're involved on our board, they're involved on all levels. So really, I, I would look at your foundation, ask yourself, is, is it reflective of who we're serving, and work on that foundation first and further the, that out to service. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tabitha, do you want to transition us to our Q&A? Yeah, so we've we've given a lot of questions, and so we want to make sure that we cover some of the questions that you all um, who are listening have. So, you know, we've we just were talking a lot about diversion and rehousing and lots of other um, areas, but what are some of the um, what options are in place in your areas for permanent housing for families? Um, in other words, where do families um, 
exit to. And so I think Liz, you talked a little bit about, started to talk a little bit about this, would love you to dig a little bit more in. Sure. Yeah. So in our, at our organization, we have our, the, the kind of full continuum from prevention, shelter. We have a, a mix of, um, you know, transitional housing programs, rapid rehousing programs, permanent supportive housing programs. Um, so some folks exit to those, you know, if they, if they need additional services, but we also try really hard to get people um, exited because those programs don't have enough capacity to meet the need. And so um, we exit folks also to you know, permanent housing and then try to pair them with other supports that make sense for them that they want. So for example, um, we partner closely with our Head Start program and Head Start understands our housing programs and, and we kind of team, team up on that. We're working with landlords all the time, um, trying to get new landlords into the pipeline, um, have existing landlords add some more units. And again, we're in rural communities. And so all we really need is a couple, couple units in this town and a couple units in that town and a couple units in that town. And so we really try to build up, you know, seek them out that way. So like currently what we're doing is looking at people who have Airbnb rentals and we're like, Hey, I know you're doing that as a little extra income. It's a separate house. Do you think you could maybe work with us um, for some, you know, we could get your rental assistance kind of provide case management, someone could live in there and, you know, could we work that kind of a deal? So we're always out there trying to, you know, look, working closely with our faith communities to, you know, the people who attend, these <laughs> go to church, you know, and we ask them like, hey, anybody interested? And so we're, we're just digging all the time and um, we can't afford to wait for some big developer to come and help us out. So we're hitting the pavement all the time looking for, um, appropriate rental and services. And again, we're fortunate that we have the whole continuum in, under our roof so we can, that helps as well. Great, thank you for that. Uh, this next question is for uh, Melissa and Allison. Um, how are you working with homelessness and eviction prevention programs in your area? Melissa, I'm not sure if you wanted to take this or if you'd like me to answer. Um, throughout the pandemic, I mean, I think we all became acutely aware of the need to really focus on eviction and prevention efforts within the continuum and that it's always best to keep families in housing, um, you know, before, before they hit coordinated entry and, and are in need of shelter. Um, we worked closely as a community with legal aid and, you know, some of our other local providers to really develop um, an intentional effort around providing interventions at the time of the eviction filing. Um, it's something that's very new. Um, we're looking to gain some momentum with that this year. Um, but the goal is that we would be able to provide some mediation services and some financial support to families really at the time that that's happening. Um, and so, you know, we feel that that's really promising for our community. We're really excited about the work and we're really excited about the collaboration. Melissa, do you have anything to add on that front? Sure, I would just add that uh, it, it, a critical piece of this was really convening um, a variety of partners. So she mentioned legal aid, the housing court, so we had uh, judges in various municipalities represented as well. We had our housing providers, um, as well as our office as the lead and starting those conversations early. You know, obviously we were blessed to have the moratorium um, that was extended several times. We eventually knew at the end that our approach would have to be different, that that was not gonna continue on. So we're really looking at from the point of eviction filing, if it's due for non-payment of rent, then at that point, what resource can we offer the landlord first before they're actually able to file that eviction and go through the formal court process. So we're currently, as Allison mentioned, really pushing forward and advocating on that front. Um, we also know that through our Right to Counsel Act that was provided the legal support that individuals are less likely to be evicted. So legal aid is such a critical piece in this partnership. Well, thank you all. Um, and we've talked a lot about various populations. And one of the questions that we had was, what are some good practices to serve undocumented families slash family members? Um, so would love to open this up to the, the, to the floor to see if you all have some great practices in doing that. 
I can jump in. Um, we we make sure that we have private funding available um, so that we can serve people without, you know, some of the strings attached that the governments require. And so that allows, and then, you know, having people who can speak in our communities, it's Somali and Spanish languages. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, that's really critical. So we can have trusting relationships and then also private resources. So it's not important that they give us all the information we'd otherwise want and or need. I would also add um, in our continuum, we have a strong partnership um, with Migration and Refugee Services, which is provided through Catholic Charities Diocese of Cleveland here. So we're extremely blessed. So should we identify um, someone that needs that has those needs, we very quickly lead them to that agency. But it's also important that while they are, you know, within our homeless service sector realm, that that we're we're able to provide them, um, we're able to meet their needs and provide them the service that they have. So we work on translation services. Many of our providers have that available on site. Others also look to this outside agency so that they can make sure that communication is clear and make sure that their needs are better addressed. So really, unfortunately, there aren't as many services as, as I'd like. Um, for that population here, but we do have strong ties for those that do provide it. Great. Uh, anyone else before we move on to our next question? All right. Um, we know that um, services <clears throat> are critical uh, when we're serving families. And uh, this next question is uh, for you, Ruben, if you could answer uh, what resources are available to provide critical mental health and other services to support families in your programs. Uh, and that's where the, the, the collaboration comes in, I think is really crucial uh, with our organizations out here in Seattle. Uh, we partner with the College Tribal Health Program. Um, they have a mental health program that services Native Americans and individuals that are married to tribal members. And then they also have a child care available. And so that's crucial in regards to making some mental health appointments. Um, due to the COVID, they also do Zoom, but and also they work with children, so they're able to go out into the field and to work with children, uh, not the schools or, you know, anywhere that they'd like to meet, not homes, and so we partner with them when we start working with uh, families or mothers that are coming through domestic violence. Uh, we have our own advocacy program, but we partner sir, with their program that has a mental health component. We work with the Seattle Indian Health Board, which has, the, has mental health as well. So we collaborate with them, but due to the volume sometimes in the clinicians or the practitioners or the therapists that are there, uh, sometimes we can't actually get them in sooner. So then we partnership again with the other organizations. And sometimes we have to step outside and work with um, other non, you know, tribal entities in regards to some mental health services that it might be in there. Um, and also our support groups that we have here currently, um, we do have some clinicians and therapists that are, are part of our organizations that run those support groups uh, to support them as they deal with some issues and as they go through issues um, that are issues that might pop up while they're you know moving into housing and stable housing or some things that led to their housing being unstable so we do partnership with organizations uh, very closely and um, they refer to us when we have services and at the same time we refer to them when they, they have the need of their services as well Beautiful. Well, thank you all so much. And I think we have time for one quick question. Um, and uh, Ruben had just sort of touched on it. Uh, we are dealing with a pandemic um, and we'd really love to hear, uh, maybe Liz, you can um, tackle this one, but how do you integrate COVID-19 tests, COVID-19 screening in your programs? So we talk about it all the time, first off, you know, and we want to make sure our staff are safe, you know, our families are safe. And so the, the screening we talk about, <laughs> we ask people, have, it doesn't restrict, you know, block anybody's ability to get services, but we just ask the question. We're always asking the question. Um, you know, we have masks, we've, uh, you know, paid, you know, early on in the pandemic when none of us knew like where to get masks you know we talked to the families we work with and we said does anybody so you know who of you sews can we pay you to make some masks and so I feel like it's just a big part of our conversations we also you know check in frequently with folks about 
how are they doing with the stress of the pandemic? And so just all it's it's all around, you know, like it, it impacts everybody in different ways. And so that allows us to kind of um, talk through it that way as just overall health and wellness and make sure people know where they can get services. And and then we have, you know, masks and plexiglass and, you know, all of the things we need to keep our staff safe. All right, well, um, thank you uh, on behalf of myself and my co-moderator, uh, Tabitha. We thank you for your time and your discussion and answering these questions. And so we're gonna now turn it over to Alexis to uh, wrap us up in the remaining five minutes. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, hi, all again, I'm Alexis. Um, and I appreciate the time that uh, everybody was able to come today. Um, that I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and I hope that you enjoyed listening to people sharing their experiences. And if you have any questions, um, I think there is a, I think on the slide, it should have all our contact information on it. Oh, awesome. You just put it up. Um, and also if you want to check out the report, there's a link to it. And then also talks about like the King key concepts as well. And then um, there's some videos that Tiffany and I also um, explained our stories on why we joined the project as well. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that we could join another webinar like this. I appreciate the host for allowing us to take the time to talk about, to talk about this project. And I hope that everybody has a great afternoon or great evening or whatever time of day it is in your in your time zone. And um, yeah, keep showing up, you know, keep if you need any like help or anything. We're here to help. And that's pretty much it. Thank you all for coming. Oh, yes, and stay safe. I love that one.